If you want to fight in a cage for a living, you need to be pretty tough. Everyone's getting punched in the face. Ten seconds. Oh, he's hurt. Could he finish him here? And everyone's getting injured. Toughness separates those who get up from those who stay down. The Jones is all over. Brutal knee to the body. Being tough isn't a skill, it's an attribute. And if you're already a good fighter, it can be a superpower. Enter the Diaz brothers. Nick and his younger brother Nate came from nothing, jumped over every hurdle, and made it to the top on their own. They're relentlessly determined, and they're tough as nails. And Diaz walks through it. One, two. They are banging, folks. During the late 2000s and early 2010s, the brothers were rolling. While Nick was running through Strike Force, Nate was starting to headline UFC events. But before Nate got his first professional fight, Nick already had 12 under his belt. He blazed a trail for his younger brother, and in the early years of a growing sport, he blazed a trail for generations to come. Nick is an absolute armored vehicle of a human being. He has a titanium chin and a relentless work ethic. He'll taunt you, he'll slap you, and he'll work you until you're dead exhausted. He's unabashedly himself, 100% authentic. Nick Diaz famously grew up in the 209, Stockton, California. Back in the 80s and 90s, it was a pretty rough spot to live. Violent crime was increasing, the city was running out of money, and communities of color were disproportionately affected. It's still an ongoing issue, but Stockton was bad during Nick's formative years. As a kid, Nick's dad Robert was mostly out of the picture. His mother Melissa raised him, Nate, and their younger sister Nina. As the oldest kid in a single parent household, Nick had to grow up fast, and naturally, he wanted to learn how to defend himself. This started at a young age for Nick, like a really young age. Look at his little elementary school mean mug with his fist up. Everyone's smiling except Nick. He's over here like, I'll take on the whole class if I have to. But this is why people love Nick, man. He's been consistent since the beginning. He started with karate and Aikido, later moving on to wrestling and Sambo. I know the Strangle Gang is laughing. They're going, he did Aikido? How come I didn't know about this? But it's important to note, he did Aikido, and then he moved on from Aikido. Around the age of 16, he started training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu under the legendary Cesar Gracie. He's always been the focused older sibling. Nick had no choice but to make it out, and at a young age, he realized that fighting was his ticket. He was on the fast track to becoming an MMA superstar, but just a year before his first professional fight, Nick was focused and on the track to becoming an MMA superstar. But just a year before his first professional fight, Nick lost a close friend. In July of 2000, Nick's girlfriend Stephanie lost an ongoing battle to depression. At just 17 years old, this changed the trajectory of Nick Diaz's life, but not his career. After that, I was grown up. Up. It was all over. I wasn't a kid anymore. I would run seven miles and back to her grave just to promise her I would make it as a fighter. A year later, Nick was officially a professional fighter. After what he'd just gone through, fighting some dude named Blaine was the least of his worries. It was probably therapeutic. Needless to say, Nick started his pro career with a four-fight win streak. He was a mainstay in California's underground MMA scene. Prior to 2006, California technically didn't allow mixed martial arts events. They were illegal according to state legislation, but California-based promotions like IFC and Ultimate Athlete lived on. Nick Diaz was one of the earliest faces in mainstream American MMA, but he wasn't Nick Diaz yet. By 2004, he was a great young fighter, but he had a couple of losses under his belt. People knew him as a jiu-jitsu guy, not Nick Diaz. He needed a fight that would catch people's attention. It was time to make a name for himself. Another fighter that got started in 2001 was Robbie Lawler. By 2004, he was 8-1. His only loss came via a hip injury against Pete Spratt. If Nick beat Robbie, it would solidify his spot as an up-and-coming star. Nick Diaz and Robbie Lawler fought at UFC 47. This is one of the most entertaining fights start to finish in UFC history. Nick comes out swinging. He's confident. He's won fights. He's lost fights. He's 20 years old and he has nothing to lose. Joe Rogan is freaking out the entire time. Nick's just being himself. Taunting Lawler, hitting him with a little Stockton slap, getting all up in his face. No one knew that this was Nick's true style. One has sudden ending written all over it. Wow, I just never expected this. I never expected to see him taunting Bobby like this and standing in front of him with his hands down. What is that? Karate Kid style stuff. <laughs> Nick Diaz was toying with Robbie. He was barking at him the whole fight. Eventually, Steve Mazzagatti turns to Nick and says, Diaz, your mouth, man. No talking. During the second round, Nick eats a mean left hook, only to throw his own right hook, sending Robbie down like a domino, face first into the canvas. Can be because he's got experience. Why would I say Combination. That 
This single moment elevated Nick Diaz into a new tier. He was a young star in the UFC, which was quickly becoming one of the world's best promotions under its new ownership. At the age of 20, Nick was already so talented, but he still had room to grow. Following this fight, I think people were surprised to learn that Nick wasn't a boxer. If you weren't familiar with him before UFC 47, you wouldn't think he was a BJJ guy either. Nick and Robbie didn't go to the ground the entire fight. Following the Lawler fight, he continued to rise in popularity with KOs and fights that went the distance. He was building a reputation as a striker. Nick hadn't shown his new fans the true extent of his grappling capabilities. That all changed at UFC 62 when Nick fought Josh Neer. Josh came out locked in in his baby blues ready to rumble. Nick Diaz, as usual, was on kill mode from the start. It was a really well-matched fight and it went to the third round. By then, it became a grappling match. They were exhausted. With about three minutes left, Nick secured a Kimura, his first submission since 2003. He's got a Kimura. He's got it. He's got a twist. He's in the perfect position. If he throws his leg over Josh Near's head, Josh is in big trouble. Look for that left knee. Trying See to it over do the it. head. He's got it over there. He's twisting it back. And That's it. He tapped. It is Fantastic. All over. He'd proven himself to be a menace of a striker, and now he was showing the world his jujitsu skills. By 2008, Nick was 15 and 7 in his pro fighting career. It doesn't look great on paper, but every loss either came as a decision or a doctor stoppage. People were saying that Nick had never truly been beaten, the fights had just ended. Quick side note about the doctor stoppage Nick and KJ Noons had their first fight back in 2007. Nick's face bled so much that they had to call it. He has a ton of scar tissue near his eyebrows that it just splits open. The same thing happens to Nate. They're just more prone to cuts, and this leads to Dr. stopping the fights. To combat this, Nick literally got his ocular bone shaved down to be more smooth. He got a surgical procedure to be able to take more punches. Nick Diaz is truly one of a kind. Around 2009, Strikeforce made deals with Dream and M1 Global, as well as picking up Elite XC's contracts when they went out of business. For a few years there, Strikeforce had some of the best talent in the world fighting in one promotion. Nick Diaz was right in the middle of it. On April 11th, 2009, Nick Diaz fought the legend. Frank Shamrock. Frank is the real deal. He helped pioneer the sport. He's the first ever UFC middleweight champion. He's no joke. At this point, he was a Hall of Fame fighter, but he was also 36 years old. I actually enjoyed watching Frank lose this fight because previous to this fight, Frank had illegally kneed my mentor, Henzo Gracie, behind the head multiple times, so it felt like a bit of karma. Nick just broke him down for three minutes straight. It ended up being Shamrock's last professional fight, and it wasn't pretty. This was just the beginning of Nick's run through Strikeforce. In under two years, he beat Scott Smith, won the welterweight title against Marius Zaramskis, defended it against KJ Nunes, defended it against Evangelista Cyborg Santos, and defended it again against Paul Daly in one of the most epic fights, by the way. And, by the way, he snuck in a win at Dream 14 right in the middle of all of that. Nick's run through Strikeforce was one of the most inspiring performances we've ever seen in MMA. He ran through top talent convincingly, not to mention the short time span in which he did it. Fans love Nick's personality. He wasn't some jacked robot who kicks everyone's ass in silence. He's a person. You can see his emotion, you can feel it. Nick was the right guy at the right time and it connected with the audience. This streak earned him fights against the most elite talent that the UFC had to offer, George St. Pierre and Anderson Silva. As you can imagine, or as you maybe already know, these were two great fights. They both went the distance and Nick ended up losing both. He proved that he can hang with the best of the best. All three of these guys are unbelievably well-rounded and Nick made history just matching up with them. As it turns out, Nick wouldn't fight for another six years following his matchup to Silva. That fight was overturned to a no contest due to both fighters failing drug tests. Anderson Silva tested positive for a steroid metabolite, while Nick Diaz tested positive for weed. You know, the stuff that's allowed now. The punishments were all over the place. Silva received a one-year ban and a 30% fine on his fight earnings, while Diaz received a five-year ban and a 33% fine on his earnings. I could sit here and talk about how ridiculous this is, but I know most of you already agree. The Nevada State Athletic Commission stole five years of Nick Diaz's career, in his early 30s no less. Now of course, the fans were simultaneously infuriated and supportive of Nick, they just wanted to see the guy fight. And six years later, he did. In 2021, Robbie Lola got his rematch, and he got his revenge.
Robbie Lawler looked incredible, but I think most people were just happy to see Nick Diaz back. He patiently waited through his unjustified punishment and came back swinging. This is what makes Nick Diaz truly great. This is why people love Nick Diaz. He plays the hand he's dealt. Five year ban? I'll wait. Technical loss to Nunes. I'll beat him in a couple of years. Face bleeding too much? I'm gonna shave down my eyebrows. Nick Diaz pushes forward. He doesn't look back. He doesn't hesitate. He just keeps going. He trusts himself. Being tough isn't a skill. It's an attribute. And Nick Diaz was born with it.